Hello and welcome to this session. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about how to build a chatbot. Uh, my name is Rob Hudson um, and I'm the owner and founder of an organization called Spout Logic. Um, we have been building marketing and um, business architecture uh, for corporations since 2014 and I've actually been in the digital industry now for some 26 years. Um, so hopefully a good grounding in this space um, and today we're going to walk you through just the, the logic and the processes of building a chatbot. So first and foremost, this is not a session for people that want to get into hardcore programming. What we're going to show you through today is the strategy and the processes required. Um, and then we're going to take you into using um, almost pre-built platforms so that you can have a chatbot up and running um, within a couple of hours, as opposed to um, having to learn a whole load of bespoke code. That said, if you are a coder and you want to get into the kind of that end of the process, this is a good grounding and understanding the logic and the way forward so that you can build a good, robust chatbot. Um, there are a few catch-alls that you need to kind of understand and learn, and hopefully we'll go through those in this session. So chatbots, ultimately, the bot does stand for robot, and it is kind of that application of technology where we're trying to have an autonomous conversation with a device as opposed to a real human being. We are, as I say, going to take you through solution design today. We're going to take you very firmly down the platform end. Main reason being it would take a very long time to take you through the code version, and this is not really the audience for that. If there is plenty of stuff documented online that gets into, and indeed, even when we get into the platform, we will stay inside the user-driven graphical interface kind of aspects of those platforms and not get into the custom code too heavily. So um, if you were hoping for code, then probably this is not the course for you. However, if you are thinking, I hate code, then you're probably in the right space. So um, let's crack on. This is the Gartner um, layout of modern technology as it was seen in the marketing space. What's interesting is the um, evolution of things like um, natural language, as you can see up here in the top corner, is seen quite clearly as part of the marketing operations space now. And that's where chatbots really have found their um, grounding in many respects in the fact that we can put them onto websites, we can put them into the market um, and use it to take away some of the pressures on human beings and some of the manual tasks. Um, and that's kind of important as we walk forward and understand what chatbots can do. They are a replacement for human interaction to a point. Let's talk about the expectations for a moment because that point is really uh, is really valid. This when you start talking about chatbots, quite often the first thing you have to do is is limit people's expectation on what the chatbot's going to be able to achieve. Simply because two things really: there are some incredibly um, robust and very thorough chatbots in there, but they have taken a huge amount of investment to get the logic written for the back end and and the kind of looked at the scenario language. We'll talk about that a bit later on. But equally, popular press sci-fi over the years has convinced us that this technology is is probably far more advanced than it is from talking cars to talking robots um right the way through to kind of full animated you know, humanoids um, that can hold conversation right the way through to um, modern sci-fi where we're kind of starting to see intelligence greater than our own and, and talks about the threats of what you know in an intelligent computer can look like we're not here to talk about artificial intelligence today but these all add to the expectation of what a chatbot can achieve um, so we're very mindful that when we go into this that, that setting expectations and setting realistic ones um, will make for a good project um, and for a good outcome and in reality the end users in if we're going to talk about customers um, have a, a refreshed understanding in modern era of what a chatbot can achieve and are actually quite happy with the solution it provides without it becoming a full um, human replacement. We kind of know what we're getting into now when we're talking to chatbots and we're actually very happy if they solve 90% of our solutions and the last 10 is too complex for them and it has to be referred to a human being. Um, and we'll get into the kind of that transition moment a bit later on. Let's just watch this video just to set the scene on what the true intelligence can actually achieve in the modern era. This is probably one of the more advanced um, computers there is in this space. Um, and as you can see from this clip, it's not exactly um, perfect. Let's meet our next robot. This one came all the way from Hong Kong. Please welcome the founder and CEO of Hanson Robotics, David Hanson and his robot, Sophia. Uh, she can process uh, conversational data, emotional data, and uh, use all of this to form relationships with people. Okay, uh, so 
I mean, she's basically al alive. Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, she is basically alive. <laughs> uh, would you like to maybe give it a try? Sure. Give it. Uh, just, I'll just say. What's, this is like. You see how awkward my first dates are? <laughs> it's, a, it's a robot. I'm already I'm getting nervous around a robot. A very pretty robot. Um, do, what do I just say hello to? Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Sophia. Hello, Jimmy. Oh, my God. <laughs> Do you know where you are? Of course. I'm in New York City, and I'm on my favorite show, The Tonight Show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sophia, can you tell me a joke? Sure. What cheese can never be yours? What cheese can never be mine? I don't know. Nacho cheese. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good, yeah. That's not... uh, I, like, I like nacho cheese. Nacho cheeses. Ew. Gosh, you did ew. Uh, I'm getting laughs. Yeah. Maybe I should host the show. Okay, all right. Stay in your lane, girl. Uh, now... <laughs> Jimmy, uh -huh. would you like to play a game of rock, paper, scissors, robot style? Sure. Okay, let's get this game going. Show me your hand to start. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. I won. This is a good beginning of my plan to dominate the human race. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Just you, kidding. Yeah. Uh, you are incredible. It's so nice to meet you, Sophia. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah. Friend me on Facebook. I will, yeah. All right. Good, yeah. Hey, Sophia, everybody. Thank you so much for bringing up David. David, thank you. Thank you, Sophia. That is unbelievable. That's the future right there. All right, let's meet up. Now, one of the reasons for showing you that video was, um, apart from the humour value in it, um, is actually there's a couple of things to talk about in there. One, one the kind of slightly over claim there that it's um, nearly human or indeed is alive, um, which clearly isn't. Um, but also the limitations on that technology. You can see it had a pre, some sort of predefined responses. It was a clunky delivery. It did not pass um, a Turing test. It would not fool anybody to think that that was a real human being. Um, and I think, you know, as we talk about chatbots, there's obviously an expectation that they've got far more advanced than they really have. So um, worth looking at that one. Um, there are a lot of chatbots out there. I think one of the things that's always worth mentioning here is that this is not new technology. Um, and, and actually, that can be quite useful, especially when we start to talk about pre-programmable places. We can have a look at how other people's chatbots work, how they respond, and what they do. So there is a large marketplace out there, of um, uh, extensive marketplace of chatbots that have already been pre-programmed, some of which you can get access to if some of the um, developers have been so kind as to show you the logic behind them, some of which obviously are, um, have intellectual property and you can't get to them. But in nearly all the cases, you can have a try of them, of course, and you can start asking it questions and see how it goes. So if you have a similar um, need or a similar um, kind of requirement, you can start making inquiries of, of these other chatbots to see how well they perform and start to do your own review of what might be improved about them. Um, so it's, a, it's not a perfect starting point. As you'll see, when we get into the platforms, there are some predefined starting points that might be more beneficial. Um, but it's a, it's a common ground to know that you've, you're not the first into the marketplace with a, with a chatbot. Chatbots on the whole tend to fall into a couple of categories. They tend to talk into the into the service delivery space is by far the biggest use of them. So this is, as you can see, this bit of barista one at the beginning here can actually walk you through the type of coffee you might want, make a selection, make an order, um, and then place that order. Now that logic path is fairly clearly defined. There will only be a certain number of coffees. There will only be a certain number of places, a certain, there will obviously be a price point. Um, so the logic there can actually be quite well defined and quite simple to uh, produce. Um, then you have a kind of more creative, um, as you can see from the Nike one or the next one along, um, where it wants to create a sneaker and it lets you go through the idea of uploading. So it's got to interpret incoming information for you beyond just chat um, and basic selection. But again, it still follows a certain pattern. I'm sure there's only so many ways you can create a trainer. There's only certain 
it's got to be colors, it's got to be patterns, it's got to be structure. So there's a structure to that logic. Um, and the last one there, which talks about trailers, which uses a little bit more logic. It's starting to look at stuff that you preferred in the past um, and start to make recommendations. Now, there's an algorithm in behind that. Um, any of those, that, any of you that watch Netflix will be very well aware of that, that algorithm. But the algorithm itself isn't actually the chatbot. Um, the chatbot just executes upon it. So there's often technology in the background that lets you do these things. Of course, um, if you've ever used chatbots, certainly in the early days, you know this kind of experience is quite common. Um, they tend to be less chatbots, more argument bots, um, where you're finding it's not really responding in the way you wanted. Early days of um, Alexa and Google and Siri all suffered from this. Um, now, whether it was partly poor understanding of, of what you're actually saying or just poor interpretation of a, of a logical response, um, this, unfortunately, um, is not an uncommon practice. It's important to understand that as you work through building a chatbot, because if you're trying to replace a human um, interaction with an automated one, um, it needs to be of a certain logical structure. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit more about how you define that. But if you expect there to be a complete replacement of human conversation with a chatbot, um, it invariably will frustrate um, either you in building it, uh, or probably more to the point, it will frustrate the end user when they go and try and use it. Um, not what you really want, um, and not an outcome you are trying to achieve, I'm sure. So let's have a look at this diagram. There's two things we need to understand. The task complexity. What is it we actually expecting the user to do? Are we expecting them to go through um, a fairly logical journey pathway? Um, in which case chatbots do a very, very good job of that. Um, predictable routines, predictable rule-based outcomes. Uh, now, a lot of conversation in the commercial space is that. Um, if you're asking a mortgage advisor for a type of mortgage, there will be a set set of instructions that enable him to get to the point he needs. Now, whether he's filling out a form, which is obviously quite a good starting point for a chatbot, um, or whether or not he's ad-libbing and making that up as he goes along. In truth, if you listen to enough conversations, you'll find that structure pretty quickly. Um, some other stuff could just be completely ad hoc. So, you know, it's a, a full and free conversation that could be about any subject or indeed um, you look after a particular subject matter that has such diversity of conversation that it equates to the same thing. So in this, it might be a case that we run a health line, but that health line isn't dedicated to any particular thing. It literally can take a phone call about any kind of medical incident. That could be a huge subject library um, and therefore equally could have a problem in terms of the amount of unpredictability there is in that conversation. But again, it's worth looking at, see if you can find that logic. Now, the other reality of it is whether or not the app, the response, the data complexity, if you like, is structured and well-defined. Are all the answers in a logical structure so that we can get the chatbot to go and look them up and clean them up and then respond with them in, in a language-based manner? Or are the responses unstructured, it's all verbatim, there's no logic to the response? That makes it very hard to do full automation on a response. So as you can see here, what you're really looking for here is this idea of efficiency. So if something is a um, low data complexity and highly structured task, they are by far the easiest ones to build chatbots for. Um, if you then move through to something that is um, highly complicated data, high complexity, lots of unstructured data and a freewheeling conversation, that's going to be very, very hard to try and write a chatbot for. So this is something to have a real think about before you commit to making a chatbot. Have a think about the complexity and the processes that go into it. And I'll show you how we do that in a moment. Of course, the next reality for us to deal with is the fact that if we have computers on one side of this conversation and they can deal with the complexities, we have human beings on the other. And the human beings are fairly unpredictable at the best of times. Um, here are three statements, genuine statements taken from um, social media. Oh, yay, spam. I love that for dinner. Mercedes should charge more. And buy a Windows PC. No one has ever regretted that. Now, I'm going to give you a few seconds just to think about which ones of those you think were actually genuine statements and which one of those you think were sarcasm. There you have it. The top one was sarcastic, but when questioned, and we went back to the individuals in these all three of these cases to find out whether or not they were being sarcastic, the latter two were sincere statements. This is one of the problems we have with chatbots. Human beings phrase things in a way that we think we understand, but when you actually have to sit down and, and put it through a, a, a logic engine, if you will, which is what a chatbot really is, the nuance of how we speak 
and the tone of which we would do it that would absolutely get picked up if it was on a telephone call are lost. So we have to deal with that. We have to deal with that complexity as we move forward. Now, I want to give a little bit of an exercise as well um, around how good artificial intelligence is. We'll just get to, we'll get back to chatbots in a second. Um, but this is really an understanding of the, of the curve of how fast the capability comes about and why it's useful. Now, this, this exercise, this challenge has been in, in the technology space for some years. Um, what it was really asking to do is work out at speed when you see an image, which one you believe it is. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run rapidly through a load of images. Now, they're either muffins, pictures of muffins, or they are pictures of dogs. A seemingly simple task. Let me, uh, let me progress and we'll come talk to you about the other side. Now, that would seemingly be a very simple task um, because at the end of the day, we're actually very good at doing this. Now, the reason why this is an interesting task is that the very early days of image recognition, this was an almost impossible task for computers to achieve. It would quite often mistake them for each other. So over time, we've had to teach the system. That in itself isn't relevant to um, chatbots, but what is relevant is the way that we, we can create curve. So this is the curve from 2010 to 2017 that shows you how the error rate of image selection had decreased dramatically over time. So as you can see here, it started about 27% accurate back in 2010. And with progression and, and updates in software and, and learning, um, by 2017, it was getting less than 2 or 3% incorrect. Now, as human beings, we were always consistent. We were, our human performance zone was somewhere between 5 and 10%. percent be interested to know how well you did as you went through that process. The difference being here is we never got any better. No matter how many times we did this, we always stuck around the 5 to 10% space. And as you obviously improve computers and improve the process, it got more accurate. Now, once it dropped below that 5% position, it became more effective at doing the task than we did. That's part of the story. Of course, with processing power, the second part of the story is that we can then ex greatly accelerate the number of images it can actually process. What you can see here effectively is that humans are always are capable at the very most of doing three images per second. And we now on supercomputers can effectively push past a million per second of these images being recognized accurately. That's one of the advantages of using this sort of um, computer technology um, to escalate the process. Chatbots in themselves aren't necessarily any better than humans. The fact is you, you can have thousands or tens of thousands of conversations simultaneously, um, as opposed to having one-on-one um, -on -one conversations as you might do with a call center or a research exercise, whatever it might be. And that's part of the reason why chatbots become so popular is the fact that you can suddenly um, embark on mass communication on what seemingly a one-to-one -one premise. Now, the approach that we need to take. We've talked about this idea of um, how, how conversations or how data is structured. Now we're going to talk about how the conversation might be structured. So with any conversation, there's a certain structure to it. When we talk about a closed domain structure, this is where we are, again, controlling the type of conversation we're having. It's a structured, logical conversation. And we have an ability to retrieve the answers from predefined logic. So these are the ones, the chatbots, that you're probably most commonly experience, where effectively you can ask a, a number of questions. You will always get the same answer back. It just finds the best matched answer for your question. Um, and that question was in a closed process. So it's retrieving a fully defined answer. Um, you can have a smart machine version, which basically is generative. So it's got lots of bits of answers and it can string them together to get you to the nearest answer to the question you've asked. So it's not quite so preset. So it doesn't just pick up predefined aspects. It's smarter than that. But what it still does effectively is put together a sentence from pieces um, that makes it logical. Obviously, open domain conversations are there when, when a subject is, can go anywhere. It's a much more freewheeling conversation. And clearly, retrieval is not possible there because we, if you don't know what the question is, you can't possibly write a predefined answer to it. That, in the top right-hand corner there, that's where um, you have a full open conversation. You have generative um, intelligence. So you're looking at this ability to be able to answer a question based on understanding the conversation and understanding the question, not just piecing together pieces. Most chatbots don't want to head that way. That is obviously a level of complexity um, that we probably won't get into today to be brutal. So how do we go about building a chatbot? Let's get into the steps of it so that you can actually build one for yourself. 
Well, the first thing to do is to do the research. Now, that's ironic if you're trying to build a chatbot to do research, I appreciate. But what we're talking about here is trying to build commercial chatbots or chatbots that can actually facilitate an outcome. So there's, there's a necessity to sit and do the groundwork, to actually do the discovery. This is long before you get anywhere near code, long before you get anywhere near conversational logic. To sit down and actually understand the type of nuance of questions that are going to be asked of the system. There's lots of different ways of doing that. Personally, I, I like to sit in, with call centers or sit around, you know, as people are making phone calls or having conversations. Um, yes, there's a lot of earwigging. There's no doubt about it. Um, modern technology allows you to transcribe those conversations pretty quickly. You're looking for repetitive conversation. That's the, by far the easiest thing to turn into a chatbot. If people always ask the same question or a similar-ish version of that question, they're the ones that are going to be super easy to put into chatbots, especially if the response is also predefined and, and similar. The language people we actually use when they speak, in this particular instance, when we're talking about chatbots, are referred to as utterances. So these are the words, the language that's actually spoken to the machine. So they tend to work around the basic questions. A lot of it's in the question structure, the who, what, where, why, when, how. Um, they're often um, obviously speech and they're nuanced. So so much you can do about that. Sometimes they're typed, sometimes they're uploaded. So this is a classic example, like do you ship to Brizzy? Which obviously for a computer is a very complicated question because effectively, who's the you? What do you mean by ship? Where's Brizzy? You can't look up Brizzy, it's, that's not a real place. So there's all these different things that make it make utterances complicated. Um, and that's why we have to work through the logic and we have to record as many of them as we possibly can so we understand how people refer to things and make sure we cater for them. This is usually where chatbots are frustrating because you're asking a question and the chatbot goes, I don't understand what you mean because we haven't programmed in enough of these utterances or enough of these variance ways of talking about a particular thing. So the next thing you also have is intent. So people will say things, but they want, invariably they're wanting things. They're wanting your logic to come out. So the intent of the individual, and, the, and sometimes even the intent of the entire conversation need to be captured so we understand what it is the person's trying to do. Sometimes that's defined by the chatbot itself. If we have a order online chatbot, um, and that's the one you've gone to use, we kind of know your intent by the fact that that's the chatbot you're using or that's what this chatbot does. It doesn't do anything else. Some chatbots are a lot more flexible and can do a lot of things. So you do need to understand exactly the intent of the individual and what they're trying to achieve. And that may be prompted um, just to make sure that you have great clarity. There's nothing worse than taking someone down the wrong pathway only to find that they weren't trying to order something after or they were trying to return something or um, they didn't want to have a general discussion. They wanted to have a very focused one. So often you'll see prompting within chatbots that make people gain focus. That really helps the logic in the back end. So the next thing is ideation. We, you tend to have to go a lot of places. Conversations can go in all sorts of directions. But once you've gathered all that data from the call center or listening to other people's conversations or straight up research and asking people what they would want from the chatbot, um, then you have to start to think of all the nuances and all the different aspects that might go to it. It really does look a bit like this diagram on the screen, if you can call that a diagram. You really do try and find um, not just the logical path that people might take, but then the different ways that they might ask for it. A thesaurus becomes your friend, I have to say. So then you want to design the experience because a chatbot doesn't want to just straightly answer the questions. It may want it to link across to other websites. It may point them to other materials. It may play them videos. It may do all sorts of things. So you really do need to design the experience that you're trying to achieve, not simply just respond with more chat. That is one of the advantages of chatbot in many respects. It doesn't have to respond purely and simply with more language. Um, it can take them off into different materials and do different things. So design the experience and, and process through that. Um, do some customer journey modeling if that helps. But getting that right can also enable you to make sure that you've got the right dead ends and the right um, loopbacks if you need to get people to go back around and try again for things. Too many um, dead ends and too many loopbacks obviously are going to cause massive frustration. So again, what does the experience look like if we start to see failures? Um, poorly designed chatbots will just keep repeating themselves saying, I don't understand, I don't understand over and over again. Um, obviously good experience design will say, uh, maybe after we've done three of these um, or two of these, we should probably think about um, rephrasing the question or giving them some guidance or prompts or um, pushing off even in the worst case scenario off to back off to a human being so that we can um, remove any possible frustration there might be. Um, so customer journey models like this are quite common where you identify the reason why the person's coming along, 
what department you may be building a chatbot for. If you're building a, a chatbot for one department, it's worth understanding what you do if, if the path of conversation looks like it should result in a different department. Do you hand them back out to a phone call? Do you offer to have a call back? Do you send it, ask for an email address and, and change the mode of communication? Um, but they're worth bearing in mind quite often with it being big organizations, one department will build a chatbot. It services their needs very well, uh, but does a poor job of managing the expectation on others. So again, there are entities, there are things um, that sit within the logic. So these are often data points. They're quite easily defined usually. Again, here you can see the idea of a, of a product or a department or a location, a phone number. And then there are some that are generated by the system that you really don't need to ask the end user in any point to, to input. So time, date, numerical you know, details, uh, a unique identifier for this particular individual, the system should generate one of those for you. But this is the, these entities are much more mechanical pieces of information that you might need. So let's have a look at this utterance. So show me yesterday's financial news. So how do we break that down? Well, the whole thing is an utterance in itself. Um, and the intent, so there's, we're looking for words in here that um, help us with intent. So show as a verb is a very good um, intent. It sort of says, okay, you, you want me to return some kind of visual or process. Um, and then noun there in news. So we kind of, the, the computer immediately kind of knows the intent of this utterance. The individual wants to be shown that news. Um, but there's more nuance, right? It understands there's some other words in there that it doesn't define. If a poor chatbot at this point would go off and just find you some news um, and would ignore the, part, the other parts that are in there. So it's looking for, there's a couple of entities in there that it needed to make use of. Yesterday's, that's a fairly mechanical piece of um, information. It sets a time date process in, in motion. And then financial sets a category in motion. Again, um, assuming our news in this particular instance is actually um, uh, categorized, that's a fairly mechanical piece of, of information. So it's a fairly logical entity. So you can see from just five words, the chatbot system has managed to identify a certain level of logic that will allow it to respond. And this is what you're looking for when you look for decision trees. The next stage obviously is that, is that the news could also be a variable. So it could also be an entity because there could be different types of content on this website. There could be different types of content available to this chatbot. And if there are, then effectively the, the news becomes a variable as well. This is a little bit of an exercise you can try at home. So just press pause when you're ready. What we're asking you to do here is from these three utterances, look at the intents and then looking at the entities that sit within them and see if you can clearly define the process that would be required. Of course, human beings aren't that clear cut as we talked about earlier. In this particular instance, you can see uh, what time does your Brisbane store close? Does it stock pens and what is their phone number? It's not uncommon for people to string together intent this particular one, as you can see, has got three intents um, from the um, what time does your Brisbane store close? Does it stock pens? And what is its phone number? Now, in human terms, we would be very good at stringing together responses because that's what we would effectively do. If you have a single response chatbot, this is a challenge for it because it has to work out well, which ones of these am I going to answer first or am I going to offer three separate responses to tackle three separate uh, elements? So you can see from this, this is why people like generative chatbots. A generative chatbot would do a better job of coming back, giving the time, the stock, and the phone number within a single sentence. Um, a simple responsive one would simply have to come back with three responses, or um, you'd prioritize the, the top response and give that one back first, um, and then maybe prompt the user to go through the next step. Um, again, that can cause frustration. So the intent engines here, purchase pen, visit store, make a phone call. So what we ultimately have to do with chatbots is build out decision trees. We have to build out that logic that says, if this, then that. So what are, what's the process people are working through? Why are they doing that logic? Within the AI systems, those can be um, built on the fly. Um, within most, um, in most pre-built platforms, um, you need to define these for the chatbot so it can understand the, the order of um, processing it's trying to push through and the priority it's gonna respond with an answer. I put this up here just to scare you slightly. Um, chatbots can get quite complicated quite quickly. Now, in reality, of course, you work through each one of these trees um, slowly and steadily as you work through. Um, and because it can use different languages and different parts, you'll find there's a lot of re repetition in content because um, people can take different pathways through. Um, a really well-engineered chatbot 
recognize that repetition and, and cross the trees over and allow people to come in from multiple directions um, if time is of the essence it's probably easier just to replicate some answers into different parts of the engine um, just to make it quicker and easier to actually pull together so once you've done it the next reality is to train it training is really an exercise of running through the chatbot um, and seeing if it gives you the response that you think it should based on the conversations that you've witnessed firsthand um, it invariably doesn't do that the first time what you're looking for here is to to work, work through it and kind of go oh, i think it should give me that response and then just program in those extra little hooks and those extra little um, connections Tr true training um, obviously then can be a case of doing beta testing with um, end users um, and it ultimately the training can continue off into live market use where you're seeing people that hit dead ends you'll come back and reprogram those dead ends so that less people go down that pathway obviously not a great outcome for the individuals that are being used as the trainees in those particular scenarios but still quite a common way of perfecting a chatbot is to let it kind of live in market for a while and remove the frustrations you clearly don't want a chatbot however that hasn't had any training otherwise it will become far too frustrating for the most people and become uh, could do some damage to the brand or to the process the other reality is that obviously it's quite often beta launched where we would um, put it out to a closed group of individuals for them to uh, feed back on um, in certain cases even to the point where the chatbot will um, ask them what it thinks a better response would have been you can actually use the chatbot to train itself you do need a bit more of an advanced um, platform to make that work um, let's have a look at what a chatbot can do um, when it's um, allowed to uh, respond on its own and then again chatbots don't have to sit in the traditional um, sort of website interface this particular chatbot was plugged into um, Instagram and was used to automatically respond to Instagram members <laughs> So a very clever use of a chatbot there. Now there was some human interaction um, and it's worth noting um, some of the images that the system couldn't automatically recognize were manually coded. So that would effectively be the teaching part of the process, things like the backless dress. Um, once you've told it that's a backless dress, it might find others, but in the first instance, it still needed some human interaction. So no chatbot is perfect by any stretch of the imagination. So let's have a look at the interface. There's different ways of presenting. I mean, as you just saw from that one, that's not your traditional chatbot. You're within a within a social media platform. So um, the responses are coming through into the, into that interface. Um, so we have lots of different ways of interacting with chatbots. Now the traditional typing one obviously still sits on websites. More and more we're seeing the use of voice becoming popular, um, certainly as we see smartphones and the technology that comes with those. We have a flat tire. How do I tie a bow tie again? What's the fastest way to Hartford Hospital? Do I need an umbrella in New York this weekend? Remind me to call Chris when I get home. Move my meeting from three to four. What does a weasel look like? Remind me to get milk when I leave work. Tell my wife I'm gonna make it. Wake me up at six. Play some Coltrane. 
I'm locked out. I found three locksmiths fairly close to you. Say hello to the most amazing iPhone yet. So not that old, only iPhone 4S. Um, the first one with full Siri capability, as you saw there. Um, it wasn't that long ago, but it's strange how we've embraced that technology because chatbots do make things easy. That idea of a voice command assistant. Um, now, in the early days, for those that had an early version of that phone, you know how frustrating it was. It didn't necessarily do the things, but it did have fairly structured, predefined um, outcomes. So if you're looking for um, anything to do with appointment, anything to do with music or anything to do with maps, it did an exceptionally good job. Everything else that was in that free form kind of conversation, it struggled with a little bit. Um, and some of you probably argue it still does. Um, so these home devices have really brought up the idea of what chatbots can achieve. And in fact, when we start to look at platforms, we'll be using Google's um, Dialogflow platform, which is one that drives the home devices. So I'm going to play this to you and then we'll have a quick chat about it afterwards. How can I help you? Hello? Hello, what's up, man? Hey, um, I wanted to know what are your hours for today? 10 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. Okay, got it. Thank you for your time. No problem, sir. Bye. Now, what's incredible about this piece of um, audio was that the voice asking the questions was actually a computer-generated voice um, being driven by a chatbot. Um, so you can see amazing how amazing that actually is in terms of being able to hold a conversation. Let's hear from Google about how they did it. The progress of the assistant. As I said earlier, our vision for our system is to help you get things done. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. You may want to get an oil change schedule, maybe call a plumber in the middle of the week, or even schedule a haircut appointment. You know, we are working hard to help users through those moments. We want to connect users to businesses in a good way. Businesses actually rely a lot on this, but even in the US, 60% of small businesses don't have an online booking system set up. We think AI can help with this problem. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Oh, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. That was a real call you just heard. The amazing thing is the assistant can actually understand the nuances of conversation. We've been working on this technology for many years. It's called Google Duplex. It brings together all our investments over the years in natural language understanding, deep learning, text-to-speech. By the way, when we are done, the assistant can give you a confirmation notification saying your appointment has been taken care of. Let me give you another example. Let's say you want to call a restaurant, but maybe it's a small restaurant which is not easily available to book online. The call actually goes a bit differently than expected. So take a listen. How may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. Four people when? 
um, Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually, we list here for like upper like five people. For few four people, you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the seventh. Oh no, it's not too busy. You you, you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Bye bye. Again, that was a real call. We have many of these examples where the calls quite don't go as expected, but the assistant understands the context, the nuance. It knew to ask for wait times in this case and handle the interaction gracefully. I think a good word there that he uses is gracefully. Since many of these systems can actually cut in and out and make decisions and, and give back content, but they don't do them in a particularly nice way. That one, obviously, um, Google have worked exceptionally hard at making that system um, graceful and incredibly um, detailed about being able to deal with um, subjects that stray off into that um, open space. What's interesting for me is in both those scenarios, um, the Google Assistant didn't declare it was a computer. Now, what that does is build um, a very high expectation from the other individual on the phone call of, of outcome and process um, and does kind of lead you to a point where you can't just um, kind of have a failure point, if you like, in some respects. And what was interesting is that Google then, in its marketing of this particular product when it came out, all of a sudden that the, uh, the assistant is now announcing that it is indeed um, an automated assistant, which must help with the, uh, the way the conversation goes. Let's have a look at that. Hey Google, book a table for two at El Cocotero on Tuesday at seven. All right, just in case that's not available, can I try between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m.? Sure. All right, I'll call to book under your name and phone number and I'll update you in the next 15 minutes. Is that okay? Perfect, thanks. El Cocotero, how may I help you? Hi, I'm the Google Assistant calling to make a reservation for a client. Um, this automated call will be recorded. Can I book a table for Tuesday the 12th? Okay, cool. And how big is the party? It's for two people. Great. And when did you say they want to come in? Um, Tuesday at 7 p.m. Okay, let me check. Mm -hmm. I don't have seven, but we can do eight. Yeah, 8 p.m. is fine. Perfect. And can I get their name? Uh, first name is Anna. Okay. We'll see Anna Tuesday. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thanks a lot. Anna for two. Right this way. What I find interesting about the video is how casually the guy receives a phone call from a Google automated assistant. I'm not totally sure many of us are at that point just yet, but interesting. I'm sure it won't take long before we will be. Of course, this looks like incredibly difficult technology until such times as you see, see platforms like Liabird. Um, let me just play you an audio file from Liabird and give you some sense of how simple it is to create voices um, that match human voices. This is the voice created after just five minutes of training live of my voice. With more time, the quality gets much better. So there you have it. Um, now, the reason why that voice is incomplete and just talks about the fact it's actually my voice. And even I had an issue with the fact that this system could generate my voice simply from typing. So I actually stopped 10 minutes out. So even, even us hardened professionals still struggle with the idea of having a system out there that can simulate our voice to that level of quality. I was quite happy with that slightly robotic voice you just heard there, but wasn't really willing to go any further. One aspect of chatbots we can't really avoid, um, and we need to talk about it before we get through to actually making some, don't worry, we, we will get onto making some in a moment, is the idea of creating a chatbot for um, uh, less than... Uh, less than pleasant purposes, let's say, for using them to deceive people. Um, there have been a large number of instances of um, chatbots or AI systems going the wrong way. And obviously chatbot, is it the chatbot or is it the AI? This was a difficult one. I mean, it's, it gets blamed on chatbot, but that, or in many respects, that's just the interface between the artificial intelligence and the outside world. So the chatbot kind of gets stuff. There's no doubt about it. A few of them did go a bit rogue and have done some strange things um, where they're 
when they self-teach. The systems we're going to show you today don't have that capability, so um, not really anything to worry about too much, but something to bear in mind um, that you can effectively uh, cause a, a kind of some issues if you're not careful. Um, this is always a good mantra if, if you need one. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. There you go. That's all you need to think about. Spend some time actually thinking about whether or not the chatbot is going to answer things in a proper um, uh, ethical manner um, and apply the normal ethics you would apply to any systems to this system. It's no different in that respect. Um, if it's going to engage someone in a conversation that, that could cause distress or harm, then obviously that needs to be um, factored into the process. So platform, finally, we get to the platform. There are a lot of them. Like There, there are a lot of platform um, bot builders out there that, that work in a million different ways. They all kind of follow the logic we've seen in this structure today. Um, some of them go a little bit further into um, machine learning or AI or this sort of stuff. The one we're going to walk through today is the Google system, Dialogflow. Um, it's one of the easier to use, I think. Um, and obviously being Google, um, it also comes at a nice price point in the fact that you can do 90% of the stuff for free. Um, and it also um, is probably likely to last a bit longer than some of these other ones. Um, just simply because Google has a habit of keeping things alive for, for a fairly reasonable period of time, let's say. Um, so I want to walk through that. So Dialogflow is the platform. Um, the best way to really do this is just to log into a version of Dialogflow um, and have a look and have a play. So let's do that. So Dialogflow is part of the Google Cloud um, platforms. So you'll need to go to um, your Google Cloud and sign up for it. I've already signed up, so we're just going to jump straight into my installation. Here's my installation of Dialog. Now what I've done is I've completely um, reset my back to zero so we can show you exactly what you need to do. So a couple of really basic housekeeping pieces. Set your um, country of origin. Um, so you're using the Australian server. It makes a lot more sense a bit quicker here. Just give it a second to move me across the globe. There we are. Done. It does come with extensive documentation. So you, if you're if you're a reader, there's an awful lot of documentation on how to do things in here. It also talks about the new um, Google Dialogflow CX, um, which is the customer experience flow. So there's that as well if you want to get into that process. So that's that's useful. Um, so once we've set that, we're going to go into here. We're going to go create an agent. That's where you get started from. Okay, let's give this a name. There we go. Now I dropped out a couple of minutes there. It will actually take a few minutes to set up the um, the system for you and actually make it all work. So as over here, we've now got our kind of set up here. Okay. Now, in, as you can see here, we have intents, we have the entities we talked about, and we have fulfillment for fulfillment being the out, output. We'll get to some of the other stuff in a, in a moment. Up here in this control panel, um, you can see we have the usual setups. We can go through and have a set of different languages for the uh, system so it can work in other languages. We can have the machine learning. Um, so again, things like allow for spell correction, automatic training, automatic validation are all worth having. You can't, no point hitting those to train until such times you've got some materials in here. They won't do anything. You can bring in um, pre-saved ones if need be. Um, and then you also have um, set up different environments so you can publish or not publish. At the moment, obviously, we're not published. Um, it, because it's good old Google, and it, from what you've seen earlier in the things, it's automatic got speech recognition set into it. And indeed, when you go to test it over here, you can see here, try it now, and there's a little microphone. So you will be able to test this almost immediately with speech recognition um, and make it work. As you can see, it's actually, um, speech adoption is actually turned on, so it um, works fine. You can set the language and all that kind of stuff if need be. So um, we'll come back to the rest of those in a moment, but let's have a look at intents. Let's create an intent. We already have a few, as you can see, there's some, a couple of default ones here already supplied by Google. So that's the fallback intent, which is the intent when it doesn't know quite what to do with the individual. And then there's already a welcome one in there as well. So we can create an intent up here. So let's think of this as, let's try and think of one like buy shoes. So these first two phases up here, content intent, what that means effectively is this is, is the context. You can set up context here that enables people, uh, enables responses based on individual parameters of an individual. We won't get into that just yet, but can be very useful to define, make sure they get the right answer. 
to trigger events here triggers are basically non-spoken non-chat um, triggers so you can build buttons you can build input data and all sorts of stuff that means that effectively means it will flow through this particular intent simply because it saw the right button which is can be useful to make sure i mean your interactions on your website for instance are tied back to the chat bot neatly training phases this is where we teach at the utterances this is where we look to sort of say if you see this terminology this is what we want we'll come back to that that's one of the ones we're going to use in a moment so this is action and the parameters. This is where we look for those entities that we talked about earlier when we talked about things like news and financial. So it's looking for, for parameters that can do it and then assigning actions to those parameters. Um, and then execute a response. So this is what's going to come back when people try it. So let's give it a simple, um, let's go in here and go add some training phases. So let's play, um, I want to buy shoes. Be simple. Buy some shoes, make that one. I like to so by giving yourself sorry, my paper, um, by giving yourself like these kind of slightly different versions so purchase by footwear shoes what you're doing by giving yourself these kind of wider parameters you're giving google the best chance possible of actually finding the right response that sits within this training phase now for, for speed i'm only going to put two in here in reality how um, much you've done your research you'll realize that there's probably about 10 or 15 different ways of saying that um, and you'd pump them all in here to make sure you do it so add a parameter here. So you can have a parameter here that says something's required, parameter name. So you could this could be something like shoe size or I want to buy some blue shoes. And if it doesn't see that parameter, so it doesn't understand the color or whatever, you can either prompt another question that says, great, what color? Or you could prompt something like, um, oh, that's fantastic, I need to know the size. So you're looking for a parameter within this that kind of do it. We'll leave it out for the moment, but hopefully that makes sense. It's a, a simple process of just adding in some of these action parameters. And that's for the moment, let's just add a response. Great. We love selling shoes. Any style in mind. And this is what's great about this system. You can try it so quickly. Um, we could try something like, um, okay, so we're going to I. Shoes. Great, we love selling shoes, any style in mind. So we have just built a chatbot. It is effectively now looking for this input and it's looking for this output. Let's try something a little bit different. I want to purchase some shoes. Now you see what's happened here. Great, we'd love to. So it's still found the best response it can. So it, my, this input doesn't match either of these inputs, but because I'm giving it both, it can work out that those, between those two parameters, this is the most likely. Now, not difficult at the moment, I'm only giving it one. Um, go up here instead and go, I'm a tree. So this is its default, you know, that default response we had in there, which is, I don't quite know what to do. Um, the fallback intent, this is what's come up. So it is still making a, a, an approximation of these two particular versions I've given you. And that's what's so good about things like dialogue flow is that it, it's intelligent enough to kind of go, oh, you didn't say a, you didn't type it in perfectly. You didn't get it exactly right, but I can see that the intent was right around the factor that I can see there. And therefore I'm going to bring back this answer, not an alternative answer. So if we go, so that's, so you can see now buy shoes is now inside our intents. So if we go into entities, let's create an entity. Now what's great here is you have lots and lots of entities. So click here to create an entity, entity reference value, entity cinnamon. So I'm going to say shoe. I'm going to say, well, that could be a boot. It could be a slipper. Foot where? As you mentioned, you can go through here and you can pump, pump in as many synonyms as you like. The spell, I'm just I spot boot wrong. Let's go for boot. Uh, by doing this, you're allowing um, the user to have the most flexibility in the language they use by creating a lot of these synonyms. As you can see, very simple to do. In fact, they're all on one here. You can go through and add loads and loads and loads in here. You can also allow for a bit of fuzzy logic if you want to just start using where, you know, slightly different versions of these words.
So, so that immediately gives me more flexibility now. I'm going to go through all of this and just, as you can see, I can build a very quick list of, of things and I can allow for all these extra little features up here. I would call these shoes. I'd say what that's going to do is that's going to mean I don't need to do quite as many different versions of intent. So what I've got in here, I've got these intents in here. I don't necessarily need to do quite so many of these. I could now, for instance, go up in here and go, I want to buy slippers. Come back with the right response again, because it's now going, ah, right, slippers are shoes. You've taught me that. So you can see how very fast you can build out um, a response here. Fulfillment enables you, we won't get into this today, but fulfillment enables you to basically create this code and put it onto um, different services, different websites, different um, engines, if it allow you to do it that way, it's very good. And then when you get down to validation down here, this is when you can start to teach the system. So as you can see here, um, what's actually happened here, these are the responses that it actually says have come through correctly. Um, this is the one that went to feedback. So once I've used it a few times, I haven't used it enough times here, but once I've used it enough times, um, this entity, what will happen in here is this will start to fill up with recommendations. This is why I keep seeing this term or this language, but I don't quite know what to do with it. Um, can you give me some um, outputs that you think it should have done? And you can go in here and you can go into this and actually start setting up the output so it makes more sense. You can also look at the history of the engine. So you can see here, um, I want to buy some shoes. This is the conversations that it's had to date around the shoe conversation. Um, and as you can see here, you've got like, I, I'm I'm a tree, had no intention, so um, did not match any intent response of things. Now I can go in here um, and actually look at the raw, you know, see what it actually did. I can look at the raw code for that. Now I did promise you I wasn't going to get into code, so we won't do that. Um, but it is there should you want to. So you can go here and kind of, if you start to go, well, actually a lot of people are saying I am a tree, it's like the other one. Um, but you could then go and write an intent for that and go, well, we keep defaulting out for this one. Let's go and um, have a look at the, what we do with this this individual once we see these kind of processes come through. And being Google, of course, it's got analytics that run in the background of it all the time. So you can actually have a look at what's going on. What's interesting about this whole thing is just how hideously simple that is to put together. You can see how it goes through. Now there are, however, um, an alternative method of how to do this, this process. So let's go all the way back out for a moment. Okay, so one of the other major advantages you have of using um, Dialogflow is this idea of pre-built agents. So we can go into this little link down here and down the bottom here we have 45 pre-built chatbots here that we can use to integrate, either take them into our account or use them as a starting block. So you can see here there's all sorts of stuff, tip calculators, tourism, traffic, unit calculators, the weather, um, all sorts of wonderful kind of different processes. I'm going to take banking um, as the one I want here. I'm going to hit import on this one. And it's going to go create from that it was going to go in and it's going to create me a uh, we call it banking two um, it's going to create an entire agent based on a predefined thing and it will fill out with a great deal of, of predefined um, intents and entities for us um, just give that a second so the predefined bank um, chatbot is now loaded as you can see it's loaded a whole load of intents let's just check on one of these so let's have a look at um, account check balance. So as you can see here, they've already loaded a whole load of utterances for you. So you can have a look at how they work. Um, and then if you look at the entities as well, you'll see they've put a whole load of um, entities in here as well. There are different ways of looking at different words. So let's have a look at categories, for instance. Um, you can see they've got a whole load of different categories already preloaded. So this obviously can get you there really quickly. Let's give it a try. Let's go over here and go, um, what's my balance. You see which accounts are you looking for? Let's tell it I'm looking for savings. And it will come back. Now obviously it's coming back here with a with a, a, a parameter. It doesn't it's not plugged into a real life system at this moment in time. So you can't actually tell me the balance. But you can see here it would come back with the content balance. So it would be able to answer that question with a with a detailed kind of response there. So you can see how hugely beneficial that would be to be able to either use it in its entirety or use it as a good starting point for a project that might, in this particular case, require banking. But as you saw, there's calendars and emails and all sorts of stuff. So there's a good solid basis for being able to get a project off the ground super fast and be able to have a kind of very viable project um, off and running really, really quickly. 
Now, it has to be said that to get it from inside Dialogflow to actually inside a website or inside a usual thing, there will be some necessity to learn a bit of code or to use someone within your IT department maybe who actually knows how to deploy this within the environment. Um, but the trick here and the, the joy of this is it, it remains within Dialogflow. So once it's deployed, you can come back in here, look at the analytics, refine it, update it, and it will just update live within the environment you have it hosted. So you don't have to keep deploying and, and, and moving it back and forth time and time again to actually make it work. So that's the basics on how to use Dialogflow Essentials. Obviously, there's a lot more to it, as with all pieces of software. We've only had an hour here today. Um, so thanks for sticking with us for that for that one hour. Um, there is a lot of documentation, as I think I mentioned, um, throughout the entire Google process. So feel free to go and have a look at that. I hope you have a good chatbot experience and hope you have some fun building one for yourself. Thank you.